Good morning. Welcome to Bethlehem Church. How y'all doing? It's good to see you. Let's all stand together. We love you. This is the battle. You see my victory. Church, we sing.
set some of you free, maybe. You know, sometimes we go through uh, things in our life where I don't know if you've been there, but I'm telling you that I have been there at times in my life where I don't know what to say to God. I don't know what words to use. You run out of things. I don't know if you've been there before, but in a place where what do you say? What do you say to God? You got a lot more questions than answers, and so how do you pray in a moment like that? How do you pray through a hurt like that? How do you pray through uh, something where you don't understand it? How do you do that? And I, I want to say to you that if you are in that place, and if you've been in that place, and you've run out of words to say, that it's okay. And sometimes you feel like you got to just come up with all these things that you got to say in order for it to work and have some relationship with God. And I just want to tell you the only thing you really need to know, especially in a situation like that, is the name Jesus. Sometimes when you're going through that, some of you are in the middle of that right now, sometimes when you've run out of words, all you really need to know is the name Jesus. Jesus and you speak the name Jesus over that there's power in it it's not just a name it is the name above all names it is the son of God who who came to the earth and overcame sin death and hell for us and made a way for us and if you've ever seen a picture of what sin looks like and how helpless we are in that sin it would help you understand why God would send his son Jesus to die for that sin because he don't want you to stay there he didn't want you to have to stay there so he made a way so this is what I want you to do some of you you've had many conversations already this morning but maybe we haven't declared that name maybe it's about your marriage maybe it's about a relationship a sickness or whatever it is but we're going to declare the name Jesus. So on the count of three, I just want you to say the name Jesus. Here we go. One, two, three. Let's do it again. Some of you maybe hadn't said that name this morning. Maybe some of you hadn't said that name in a while. But I'm telling you, there's power in the name Jesus, all right? It's not about your strength, what you've done, what you haven't done. It's about what Jesus has done and his strength and his power. So we're going to say it again on the count of three. One, two, three. Now listen, we're going to say it one more time because some of y'all hadn't said it yet. You're just listening to the people around you. But there's something when you declare that name with your mouth, your tongue, your heart, say the name Jesus one more time. One, two, three. Just wanna speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. And I just wanna speak the name of Jesus. Dark addiction starts to break. He can break it. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. Let's speak some truth. Cause your name is power, and your name is healing, and your name.
Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets and Jesus in the darkness for every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Thank you, Lord. We can declare that name. Where else are we going to go? You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We bless you, Lord. We give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You guys go ahead and be seated. Amen. Good morning. Hey, it's so great to have the opportunity to come here in the name of Jesus and worship together. And I just want to say to Joel and Chevis and the band, our worship leaders, thank you guys so much for leading us so well every week as we get together, gather together. In Jesus' name, and it is in Jesus' name that we gather together. So whether you're here in the north venue or you're in the south venue, you're watching online or you're at one of our campuses at Oconee or 211, we are honored that you are here to worship with us. And that goes for you, whether you've been here a long time, whether you've been here for the first time in a long time, or maybe you're brand new to Bethlehem Church. What an honor to be able to worship together today. If you are new, um, we'd love for you to get to know a little bit more about our church. The best way for you to do that if you're new to Bethlehem is to take out your phone, take a picture of the QR code on the screen, or go to the app or the website and fill out the connection card. That'll help you get to know us a little bit better. We also want to meet you. So if you're here, we'd love to meet you. I hope you'll drop by and introduce yourself. We'll have some staff down here at the front after the service. We'll also have some staff in the lobby. And I need to mention the fact that you are sitting next to some of the nicest people on the planet. Not all of the nicest people on the planet. 
um, but some really nice people. So if you haven't met the people around you, and maybe you've been sitting next to them for years and you don't know their name, you can just blame it on me and say, Pastor Kevin said to make sure I introduce myself to you and meet those people around you because they're great. Hey, we get to worship through giving as well. Every week we see that as an act of worship. It's an act of trust. It's an act of obedience as we give our first and our best. There's four ways that you can give here at Bethlehem Church. Many of you have already done that online already. And if you haven't joined us in that, I hope you'll join us in that opportunity to worship. Uh, Pastor Jason is here with us this morning. He's going to kick off a new series called Glorious Discontentment. It's from the book of Nehemiah. So if you'll go ahead and open up your app or get your note sheet and pen and pencil out, most important thing you're going to need this morning is a copy of God's Word because that's where we start and that's where we finish here at Bethlehem Church. And let's get started. Started, let's get kicked off in this new series, Glorious Discontentment. So glad you're with us across our campuses, here with me at 316. I hadn't met you. I'm Jason. I know most of you. Happy New Year. Happy cold January morning wherever you are at. Oconee 211 here with me in the South Venue. Maybe you are watching online. I don't know, but we're just glad that you would tune in for a few moments with us. We are going to hop into a uh, series called Glorious Discontentment that's going to take us for the month of January, but let me begin by saying there's a, t and I've grown up around the church. I don't know what your background is. My dad was a preacher. And so like, I, I know oftentimes there's this uh, thing that we do when we hear a teaching or God's word open, at least I've done in the past where like maybe, you know, preachers preaching. And I think to myself, man, I wish so-and-so were here to hear this. You know what I mean? Or I wish, you know, I, you know, I wish they were here. I wish she was here. I wish he was here. And beauty of technology is you can send them a link now and say, Hey man, you know, especially it's like the pastor preached on sin and you send them a link, go, Hey, I want you to listen to this. You know what I mean? <laughs> Called Captain Subtle there, right? All that to say, all that's good, all that's fine, I think you should do that. But I just want to begin by our first really Sunday where everybody's back together in the new year by looking at the person that you came with today and saying this to them. We're just going to own this, okay? It's just us, 2022. Here's what we're going to say. The word today is for me, not you. Do it right quick. Look at the person you came with. Say it like you mean it. Say it. Don't you be lying. Don't say it like you mean it. It is for me, not you. Got your Bibles, the Old Testament. Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we are at. Before we get to Nehemiah, I'm just going to kind of tease him a little bit today and let you introduce him. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Nehemiah all the way today because I want to go back and uh, get to the heart of Jesus, which is why Nehemiah matters. So I want to make sense. I think sometimes we teach the Old Testament without the New Testament. We miss Jesus. And so I want to start with Jesus to get to the Old Testament because Jesus is the point. Church, are you with me? Right? All right, everybody's with me. Now, there's a way we have when we read the Gospels, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read the Gospel accounts. Many times when the miracles of Jesus happen, we read what Jesus did, right? Like he turned water into wine, John chapter 2. He made the blind see, the lame walk, or, or he fed uh, X number of people with just a little food, whatever it'll be. And oftentimes we see the what Jesus did, but we miss the why. Like the Gospels are really good, and we skate, pi skate past it at getting to the why. How Jesus looked at people, how Jesus had compassion on people, Jesus' patience, the intricacy in which Jesus saw and was moved. So I want you to see something. You don't have to turn there. Go to Nehemiah 1, but Mark chapter 8. I want to give you an example of this. Jesus is about to feed four thousand people with food that wouldn't even feed 20 people. He's about to make a whole lot of food out of nothing. And we know this story, right? We know the 5,000, this is the 4,000, but there's a backstory I want you to see because we missed this. And I think this will help us as we go on this journey. Here's what it says, Mark 8. 
In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, listen to what Jesus says, I had compassion on the crowd. They've been with me now three days. Like, I'm glad you guys are here for one hour. That takes work to get you here for an hour. These guys have been there for three days, right? And had nothing to eat. And, I've seen, uh, and if I send them away hungry to their homes, they'll faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. So let me give you three quick observations, because Jesus says something we skate past. Jesus was able to put himself in the shoes of other people and see through their eyes. So Jesus says three things. Here's why I'm about to feed them. Here's why I'm about to do a miracle. They've been with me for three days, three days straight. They got nothing to eat, and they've came a long way. So if they go home, they're going to faint, right? Repeatedly, the gospel writers would make sure we got that Jesus saw the crowd and saw people. Just It's almost like Matthew, and this is Mark in this case, would go, when we looked out at the crowd, when we looked at people, we saw people with all kinds of burdens. We saw people with all kinds of messes in their life. They were all bothers to us. But when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them. He looked out at them as sheep without a shepherd. And in that time, sheep without a shepherd were people who were a mess. And so when you, miss, when you see this, here's what I want to say as we start a brand new year, 2022. What we have to know, and one of the things that's the most unspoken challenges to walking with Jesus in our culture, in our fast-paced self-imposed pressure and drama-filled little worlds that we all have, me too, not just you, where we go from one thing to the next, one function to the next, one kid's thing to the next, one pressure point to the next. In that world, all of us have it in us to be completely consumed with what's on our plate. So I put this in your notes. I put it on your app. I just want us to begin here because this is where we're going to start our year, just owning this as a body. What do you say? If there's an unfortunate life principle, it's simply this. Nothing is obvious if it's not happening to you. Nothing. All right, y'all with me now. Okay, I got a couple. Sometimes this crowd, I got to say, if you're with me, they're with me over here. This crowd's still asleep, okay, this side. Nothing's obvious. With Jesus' own words, he shows us love takes work. Slow down. Put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. It's called empathy and see it through their eyes. This isn't in your notes. This is just me saying, I think we'll all agree on this. Love requires, all right, that we forget our own needs in order to think about someone else. Is everybody with me? So what do you require? All of us would go, absolutely. That's what love requires. I got to do that for my kids oftentimes. You got to forget about me for them. That's what love, nobody's against this. We would all agree with this, but this is way more difficult to incorporate in our lives than we are honest about. See, the lazy diagnosis right now of our society, let's go back to if you were here last week, talked about cynicism. The lazy diagnosis, the cynical diagnosis of our society right now in our culture is when we look out, we see all the hurt, see all the pain, see all the busyness of people, here's what people will say. Lazy, lazy diagnosis, but we've all done it. Well, you know, man, nobody cares about anybody anymore. Everybody's just selfish. Obviously not us, but everybody else. Nobody cares about anybody everybody's just selfish. Like pastoring, you're constantly working with people across generational lines. Like I look at, I love Bethlehem Church, it's multi-generational. Some crowds are way young, some crowds are way old. We've got a multi-generational church. But the interesting thing, no matter what age you are, there's this tendency I've seen now that I've got a little life experience, that every generation has the ability to look at the generation that follows them and go, well, compared to us, they're lazy and selfish. Every generation, right? Like when I began, he's right here. He's like, right. He's got white hair on the front row. He's like, that's right. That's right. He preached it, pastor, <laughs> right? But listen, when I began ministry, I started working for my dad and his generation, the 50s and 60s, the boomers, okay? Uh, the boomers, 50s and 60s. And I mean, they would say this tongue in cheek. And my dad's my hero. He passed a few years ago. But they would kind of poke at us this tongue in cheek way. Well, if you guys knew what we went through, and I mean, when we started a church and when we pastored, we walked in the snow uphill both ways to get to church, right? Now I have to plead with people to come and not just sit at home in their pajamas, right? And so the reality is they can do that. They would push, but I see it myself now. I'm, I, I employ 20-year-olds now, right? I employ 20-year-olds and I think to myself, what a bunch of lazy bums, right? <laughs> Compared to me. 
<laughs> compared to my generation. Church, here's all I'm, we just got on this. The easy thing to do is to look at the world, to look at our culture, and label everybody but us lazy and selfish. That's just the, everybody, it's just how it is. Everybody's so busy. We get the phone running. I'm like, I got you. I'm with you. The honest and self-aware thing to do is to raise our hand and just admit that there's never been a time that it's easier to be self-absorbed than it is right now. Listen to me. Selfish people want everything for themselves and don't care about anybody. I don't think you would be at church on a Sunday or even being tuned in if you were by nature just selfish. Selfish people don't care about anybody else and just want everything for themselves. But self-absorbed people, right, are so preoccupied with their own pressures, their own interests, and their own problems, they don't have the margin, right, to be attentive to things that don't concern them. What I'm saying is just this, not pointing fingers, raising my hand. We live in a time where there's a tendency, unless it bumps up against your life, unless it crosses path with you or, here it is, your kids, unless it inconveniences your day or bothers your rhythm of life, there's a tendency, not because we don't care to not see it, but because we're so consumed with what's on our plate. So as we begin 2022, you're not going to hear a series from me on New Year's resolutions. I have nothing against them. I have a few in my own life, but you're not going to hear a series on New Year's resolution to make your life happy and your marriage healthy and your kids awesome and you're going to slay 2022. Those are great. It's great. I'm all for it, as you can tell by the expression on my face, right? I'm all for it. That's all good. But here's what I am going to say. All I'm going to begin our years by going, I'm not even going to look out and go, here's all the things we need to fix in our community. What I want to begin the year with is just asking us as a body is do the things that concern God, do they concern us? Do the things that move the heart of God, does it move our heart? Because if there's an unfortunate life principle, that's just true, then nothing is obvious unless it's happening to you. Can I give you the second thing? All right, this is just setting the context. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Nehemiah, but I'm going to tell you why this series matters. Here's the second thing. Your life, it's a life fulfillment principle. Your life is defined by your ultimate problem, right? So if, if, uh, uh, the obvious thing, the unfortunate thing is nothing's obvious unless it's happening to us. The second thing is your life is defined by what you think is your ultimate problem. There's a guy named Richard Simmons that said that. Now, <laughs> speaking of generations, <laughs> by Richard Simmons, some of the, everybody 20 years and younger, 30 years and younger, like, who's that? Well, he was this guy who wore short shorts before they were cool, okay? <laughs> and he did this sweating to the oldies. Some of you are like, I've never heard of him. Go home and YouTube it. You're welcome for that image, okay? <laughs> go, home, <laughs> go home and put that bad boy on YouTube. You're welcome from your pastor. <laughs> Happy New Year. Happy New Year, right? Not that Richard Simmons, but Richard Simmons, who's an academic and philosopher. And here's what he's saying. If you step back and look at your life, there is a major problem or pressure that is always consuming your mind, your energy, and your thoughts. Whether it's making money, whether it's staying fit, whether it's being known, whether it's keeping the kids happy and healthy, whether it's having enough to retire when I want to retire, where I want to retire, it can be something more noble than that or it can be way less than that. Here's what he's saying. The idea is simply this. People put their best energy and thoughts, their emotion towards what they think their greatest problem is without even thinking about it. So in a self-absorbed time, even for you and I, what if the danger is the thing that gets our energy, thoughts, and emotions 10 years from now won't even matter? Pastor Francis Chan famously said, what if the danger in American society is not success, but succeeding at things that don't matter? Our society is set up for you to chase success that won't matter 10 years from now. You know that, don't you? Right? And that's the ultimate idea of being self-absorbed. What if that, and so, so the, here's the third thing, and then I'm just going to introduce you to Nehemiah real simply this morning. If there's an unfortunate life principle, I think we all can go, yeah, that's true. Nothing's obvious unless it's happening to you. If there's a life fulfillment principle, which is simply this, whatever you define as your greatest problem, that's what you spend all your energy and thoughts on. Here's the third thing, and this gets us to Nehemiah. The third thing is simply this. Does what, the spiritual maturity principle is simply this. Does what moves the heart of God, does it move me to action? 
Spiritual maturity is not what latest worship Spotify playlist you have on your t- phone. I got the newest. You heard the newest. No. Spiritual maturity is not about what latest Christian cliche or cool Instagram pastor you've retweeted or thrown this quote up on Instagram. It's not spiritual maturity. It's cultural Christianity. Spiritual maturity is not even how long you've attended Bethlehem Church. Spiritual maturity is, does what concern the heart of God does it concern me? Because let me tell you about self-absorbed Christianity, which I can be cultural Christianity 101, which is what we're going to war against the first part of this year. Self-absorbed Christianity and cultural Christianity is this. I am 100% dialed into the fact that I need God concerned with what I'm concerned with. I, I would tell you this. All of us in this room, we want God to be focused on the things that plague us, the problems that we have. What well, we're just starting a brand new year is going, does what concern God, does it concern us? We want God to be on our page. I'm just asking the question, are we on God's page? Are we on God's page? So enter, that's the idea. And let me say this, the idea of glorious discontentment. We want to live in a blessed life. I think the blessed life is not the bountiful life of time. I think the blessed life is when we find the heart of God and find our place at the heart of God. And I'll show you that. There's a story about a guy named Nehemiah. I'm just going to give you the first few moments of his life today to get us going. In fact, let's just say that name because it's a cool name. Nehemiah. One, two, three. Nehemiah. Good name, right? Let me give you the timeline. It's not in your notes, but it'll help us get there. A thousand years after Moses, right? Babylon, Israel is in a really bad spot. The Babylonian empire has taken over Israel has desecrated the temple and wiped out Israel, Jerusalem. They have been divided northern and southern kingdom. Give me a little background here. Babylon comes in, King Nebuchadnezzar overtakes, overthrows them in 587 BC, destroys the temple, which was the holy place in the Old Testament. Before, and so what happens is they send many of the Jews back to Babylon. They, can, they send them back to Babylon, exile them back to Babylon. So think in this time, think Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you know your Bible history, if you don't, it's cool. They're in there. Think Daniel, Shadrach, think Esther in, in the Old Testament. These are all things that were happening at this point, right? Well, King Cyrus comes along from Persia because back in this day, it was survival of the fittest. The Persia defeats Babylon some 70 years later defeats them. And King Cyrus lets the Jews go back to their homeland if they want to. Many of them decided to stay in Babylon, which was now occupied by Persia, 800 miles from Jerusalem. But some of them go back and begin to build, rebuild the temple. There's a remnant that went back and began to rebuild the temple. You can read about that in the book of Ezra. And then Nehemiah steps into the scene. Nehemiah lived in Shushan, which was the capital city of Persia, 800 miles away from Israel. Let me say it again. He is 800 miles away from Israel. There's a group that have gone back to rebuild the temple. He is a cupbearer for King Artaxerxes, who's the Persian king at this point. What was a cupbearer? A cupbearer in this time was a guy before the king would eat who would taste his wine and taste his food to make sure it wasn't poisoned. That was his job, right? Think about this. What do you want to be when you grow up, little Nehemiah? I just want to be a cupbearer, right? <laughs> I want to drink wine, <laughs> not for fun, right? But to make sure the king doesn't die. That was his job. He was a Jew living in Babylon. That was his job. Now, here's the thing. He found great favor to King Artaxerxes and their family, right? He found great favor. And so even though his job probably wasn't the top of the list of to do when it came to safety, he lived a life of plush and comfort because he was so accepted by King Artaxerxes, 800 miles away from all the mess that's going on in Israel. So I'm just going to read the first few verses to tell you why I think this series matters, why I think God's calling us to a season of prayer and fasting as we begin a new year. Look at what it says. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, aren't those fun names? Now it happened in the month of Chislev, there's another one, in the 20th years I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, which means another Jew, with a certain men from Judah, came back, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the exile. So these guys come back to Persia. They come back to report to King Artaxerxes, and he says, I just stopped and goes, how is our brothers doing? How are the people who've gone back to Jerusalem or homeland? Nehemiah's never been to there, but he's just asking about the people who've gone back. 
people who've gone back to rebuild the temple, and how, how are they doing? He just stops and asks. He asks the question about people that, have, that in proximity were of no concern to him. He asks. And here was the answer. The remnant and the prophets who survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So he looked up and he was curious about something that was happening 800 miles away. Now that's a hike in biblical times. In our times, 800 miles is a two-hour flight. In biblical times, on the back of a donkey, right, or a wagon being dragged by a horse, that's like a few days journey, right? For us, it's no big deal. In fact, half of that distance away, 400 miles away, there's a big game happening tomorrow night. Anybody hear about that? Yeah. Right? In Indianapolis, right? Like, like 400 miles away. <laughs> it's a big game, and it's on our radar because we're so connected. In fact, how do you know it's like an eight-hour drive? Well, Pastor, how would you know it's an eight-hour drive? Because I'm going to leave tonight to go to the game, right? <laughs> so, what you, Pastor, how did you do that? Well, here's how I did that. Two weeks ago, I got a phone call from a group that we work with. Uh, their home base is in Indianapolis, and they said, hey, Pastor, we know uh, none of us are, uh, you know, college football fans, but you got a team, like your church is like 20 minutes from Athens. I go, absolutely. Here's what they said. Do you want a box seat on the 30-yard line <laughs> for the game? Wait, wait. And before some of you go, we pay him too much for free. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> so, uh... How much did you pay? Nothing. <laughs> On the 30-yard line in a box seat, Pastor Jason was moved by the things that move the heart of God, right? <laughs> so tomorrow night when you watch the game, Kirk Herbstreit runs his mouth about Georgia. You're going to see my hand reaching over there grabbing him. <laughs> going, shut your mouth, man, right? But <laughs> you guys thought that was funnier than 830. I guess they were out. If you're an Alabama fan and they win, I don't know who's preaching next week, okay? And so, but it's a whole other, it's, a, it's forever away, right? It's a whole other world away back 800 miles. Here's all I want to say. And Nehemiah stopped and asked. Here's what I'm just trying to say. I put this in your notes. Nehemiah, listen to me, his feet were planted in Persia, but his heart was connected to God. You do not realize how easy it is for your heart to be dialed into right where you're at, not connected to the Father. The report he got when he asked about the walls of Jerusalem, where they were in disrepair and the gates were burned down. A Old Testament city that was unwalled was just asking for trouble was asking for raiders, was asking for uh, people who would come in and basically they lived under constant strife and turmoil. Constant strife and turmoil. That was what it was. They're trying to go back and rebuild the temple and they're under constant strife and turmoil. They are distressed. But here's the question. What has that got to do with Nehemiah? He didn't put them in that situation. In fact, this was generations before them. They had made the choices they had that had gotten them captive and conquered. Right? Any elementary reading of the Old Testament would tell you God was committed to the nation of Israel over and over and over again. Nation of Israel would worship false gods. Nation of Israel would disobey God, and he would stay committed. He had a covenant. He had an unrelenting promise that he stay committed to them, no matter how far they strayed, no matter what calamity they were in. So listen to me. Even though Nehemiah had nothing to do with the situation that was happening 800 miles from him, and he had begun to gain favor and was living in the king's court, if Jerusalem was special to God, it was special to Nehemiah. What mattered to God, the question I'm asking is, does it matter to us? And in a culture that is quickly and easily, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm raising my hand, we all can live self-absorbed. Right, where our mind is on the things that we are about. I'm, I am saying we actually have to be intentional about not being self-absorbed. This is the practical part of the message, what I'm calling our church to. I am beginning 2022 
by saying we've actually, as a body, as people, we don't have to work to be self-absorbed. That's the tone of our day. We have to be intentional not to be self-absorbed. Because here's what happens in the church. Not Bethlehem Church necessarily, but the capital C Church. We have a way when we look out in American society and bemoan the state of the moral collapse of our time. Do you think our time is in this time of moral collapse 100%? We look at the depravity, we look at the darkness, we look at the idolatry, we look at the things that are valued, and we have this tendency, we look at it, and we bemoan the state. We whine and we groan and we complain at how bad things are when it comes to the morality of our time. Church, can I tell you this? We have to guard from the sin of indifference. What is that? Apathy is I don't care. Indifference is I see it, I know I should care, and I still don't because I'm so consumed with what consumes me. We have to guard ourselves from that. G.K. Chesterton, who was a famous author, I think he got it at the heart of being the tendency for all of us. And again, I'm just saying this is us as a body. It's us just owning this, going, God, open our hearts. I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He's a famous English author, and he talked about self-absorption, being self-absorbed in our faith and our Christianity. He says the danger is simply this. It isn't that they can't see the solution. It's that they can't even see the problem. See, the the unspoken ethic of our day is, is, is what you don't know can't hurt you. And if it doesn't cross my paths, I hate it, but, but there's really not anything I can do, nor is it any of my business. See, this series is not about somebody fixing everything or, or, well, Jason, I've got so much. This is just about somebody doing something, right? It's all of us as we begin a new year. So I want you to see this. This is so big. And here's where we'll spend the next three weeks. I'm going to walk you through the story. You're going to love it. It's a powerful story. Here's where we're spending the next three weeks. This is so huge. Nehemiah was moved by a cause that was close to his heart but was not about his well-being. From the front to the back, Oconee 211, what you're going to see is a picture of somebody who carried the heart of Christ even before Christ was on the scene, who was moved by something that was close to his heart but would not benefit his life directly. Whew. Self-absorbed cultural Christianity is I move to action if little Johnny and little Susie are inconvenienced. And I pray, and when I pray, the majority of my prayers are about me, myself, I, and the babies in my house. That's where my prayers go. Right? I want you to see what it says. As soon as, as, soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And look at what it says. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He heard the news about the remnant, the few of God's people who were giving their lives to rebuilding the city. He heard they laid in ruins. He heard day in and day out they're being attacked. Right, The walls are down. They have no protection. Instead of going, man, I hate that. It broke his heart. But look at what it says. He didn't say when he heard the news about Jerusalem, he started fasting and praying. It says he continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Can I tell you why I'm inviting us to 21 days that will begin tomorrow of praying and fasting and what that looks like? Let me get real practical and explain it. The reason I'm inviting, the reason I think Nehemiah's powerful story is that he didn't hear and then begin to pray and fast he was, he had a practice of praying and fasting, and that's why he was in tune with the heart of God. Whew. Somebody just laid it on you right there. He did not pray and fast because he heard bad news, because he heard news that moved his heart. Because he had a practice in his life of praying and fasting, he was moved by the things that moved God's hearts. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. It is impossible, Bethlehem Church, to know God's heart from a distance. You just can't. Now, listen, make sure we get this. Nehemiah, think about the times that we're moved and our heartstrings are pulled on. 
Nehemiah didn't have pictures of the carnage of Jerusalem. He didn't have a dramatic slideshow with Sarah McLaughlin tune playing, I will remember, you know that? Or in the arms of an angel. A, he didn't have a slideshow with the people in Jerusalem walking around rib show and hungry with no, none of that. The things that we go, oh, that's off. I didn't have it. He didn't have a preacher up there kind of going, hey, man, manipulating and going, you need to give to this, you need to do that. It's nothing. He didn't have a missionary that came in and did a slideshow and go, let me tell you what's going on 800 miles. He heard about it. What did he have? He had a deep connection to the heart of God. This would not convenience his life, but it convicted his heart. And he was called to move. Jesus taught us Bethlehem Church, Oconee 211 right here in this room. Jesus taught us with his words and he modeled it with his actions that prayer and fasting are how we intentionally get to know God's heart. Fasting, I want everybody to hear me because there's a confusion at times biblically over this. Fasting is the choice for a specific period of time to refrain from something we would normally consume in. That's all it is. The Bible says in Matthew 6, when Jesus defines what a, what a follower of him will do, he says, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Most people go, giving, yes, Christians should be generous. Praying, yes, Christians should be prayer. But Navy SEAL elite Christians, they're the ones that fast. That's what we think, right? Uh, yes, giving, absolutely. Yes, praying. But like fasting's for guys like you, Jason, right? Fasting, when actually Jesus says the practice in a believer's life, when you give, when you fast, and when you pray. It would just become a practice in our lives. So as we bark, what I'm laying out to you, what does it look like? We're going to begin tomorrow. The idea is for us, to say, I'm going to choose to refrain from something for 21 days. What does that mean? We actually put a guide together when you leave. You can go online. If you got the Bethlehem Church app, it's on here. Our discipleship team, Kevin, Angela, a group of them, Dustin, they did a great job putting this together. And it just gives you the idea. Maybe it's a meal. Maybe it's lunch, right? Maybe it's caffeine. Maybe it's sweet. Something that you normally partake of. My encouragement would be doing something food-wise, in this season, just refraining from something for 21 days. Now, here's what I want you to hear. Sometimes we miss this because what we're doing when we fast, maybe it's technology. Many people have become dependent on social media and constant technology. Maybe it's that. I don't know. This between you and God. There's all kinds of examples, but let me make sure you get the heart about it because sometimes we can even fast self-absorbed. Well, you know, I, I mean, the church is doing this, and so I'm going to fast this because I'm trying to lose weight anyway. That's the essence of being self-absorbed. I'm going to fast. Oh, I'm just going to hop in there and do it anyway because I was already trying to do this for my... Do you see it? There's no obligation. There's no me twisting your arm. This is just an invitation. So what do you mean, Pastor? It's the idea is for 21 days, I am choosing this or excuse me, instead of choosing this that I normally do, in this time I'm choosing you. I am saying no to this to say yes to this. You see it practiced all through Scripture. It sounds like this unbelievably huge act of devotion in a self-absorbed culture when actually it's us warring against self-absorption. What New Year's resolutions do we need to have? Happy, healthy, whole family, marriage better? No, I'm just saying, what if we just say, hey, for a season, 21 days, what does it look like to pray and to fast? Do you know the power of thousands of people that call Bethlehem Church praying and fasting and getting in tune with the heart of God? Whoo! Yeah. Listen to me. The opposite, what I tell you, you've got to work to not be self-absorbed in this culture. The opposite of that is this. Now, what we are saying is this. So if you give up lunch... Right? I'm going to give up love. What you're saying is in this season, you are more important than this. It's us putting our antenna toward the things of God. It's just a practice that connects us with the heart of God. In fact, last year, if you were part of it, you know that we did uh, during the 21 days, January 10th through the 31st. Again, there's no obligation. When you come in next Sunday on any of our campuses, we're not going to look at you and go, did you fast this week? Right? If you didn't, you can't get in. No, we're not doing any of that. It's just an invitation. Students, you're invited. Grandparents invited, 
kids invited. We're just inviting you. What does it look like to say no to something for a season just to make sure? It, well, that's just radical thinking. Actually, no, it's just faithful following Jesus. There's just nothing radical. It's radical in America to talk about fasting because we don't deny ourselves of anything. It's like it's funny when I've done this. Everybody's like, it's like a joke. We joke with Jason. Yeah, I'm going to pray, but man, fasting, man. Whoa. You're like, hey, just relax, right? Nobody has to. It's an invitation. And all it is is just us turning our antenna toward God. Whatever it is for you. That's all I'm trying to do. Now, here's the cool thing. Last year when we did it, many of you did, man. And God had great stories over. It was awesome. But we, on Wednesday nights from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, January 12th, 19th, and 26th, last year, if you remember, how many of you were part of our fasting last year? Raise your hand. 21 days. Many of you. Raise your hand. Get it up. up, up. All right. A lot of you weren't. Cool. Many of you were. So invitation for you. What we did last year was we online from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, myself, the band, we just met together and you were watching from home and our season of distancing, blah, da, 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 da. This year, we're doing the same thing, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, but we're inviting you to be a part of it in the room if you want to be. It'll be online, but three Wednesday nights. Back in the day, which is, sounds crazy, you would go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and sometimes you'd go another time. Now it's like unbelievably crazy to think, go once a month, right? <laughs> but we're saying, what if we begin our time January 12th, 19th, and 26th? I know you probably can't be at all three. What I'm saying across all of our campuses, one hour, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock, we're going to worship and we're going to pray together as a body. 7 to 8 the next three Wednesday nights. There's no child care. Student ministry will be happening over here in the South Venue. No child care provided, right? <laughs> you bring the kids or, man, here's a crazy thing. You'll pay for a sitter when you go see a movie. What if you pay for a sitter to come pray and fast? It's crazy, I know. But listen to me. What does it look like for us? It's my challenge. You, well, Jason, I want to be at all three of them. Cool, you can be. All of our campuses, we're inviting you. Choose one Wednesday night. I'll be here. The band will be here. Our campus pastors will be here. And we're just one hour, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to pray. And as we are fasting together, I think the power of God will sit amongst us in those times. I want you to be a part of it. You're invited. No obligation. No arm twisting. Wednesday's worship in the Word. The next three Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock in this room. We're just going to, you can watch online if you can't be, choose one of the three. You can be all three if you want, or choose my challenges. Everybody in every campus calls Bethlehem Church home. Choose one of the three to be a part of. One of the three to be a part of. It'll be a powerful, powerful time. So when you leave today, there's a guide at the back. And here's what I want to ask you to do across all of our campuses in this room. Just stand with me for a moment. breakthrough. A lot of times you begin a new year, it's kind of like there is new hope, there is new dreams, there is the, you know, in the last two years, 2020 and 2021, it's been like, man, and I know 2022, there's still all kind of challenges and all this. And so a lot of times we think breakthrough. This is the year of breakthrough. And what I know is the idea of me saying, does what concern God concern me? Here's what I know. Many people would go, dude, my life, my family, the things happening in my life right now, I feel like the walls and the gates are torn down in my family, <laughs> in my life. I get it. Some of you watching at home, you can't be here. You're dealing with sickness right now. I get it, man. It's like the walls are torn down, the gates are torn down. And oftentimes the word breakthrough, that's what 2022 year breakthrough, breakthrough for my marriage, breakthrough in my family, breakthrough in my finances, breakthrough, what an awesome. But here's where I want to challenge you. Here's the challenge. We think breakthrough means God getting involved or seeing or doing something in the midst of what we got going. I need breakthrough, which means my kids, I'm praying for breakthrough. God, I need to get you, I need you to want what I want for their life. I need you to move in healing for this person. That's what I want. That's what I'm praying for. I need you to be concerned about that. All right. Or I need this better opportunity at my job. And we've been praying about it in our future, our need. And so we do that. We're like breakthrough is when God gets involved in our every day. And what we're saying is what if breakthrough for the church is when we say, God, we want to be concerned about what concerns you. We want to be moved by what moves you. Not this, the essence of self-absorbed Christianity is we pray to keep our life safe and healthy. That's what we pray for. 
And what we're saying is intentionally for a season, we just want to get on the page with the things of God, the heart of God. And I know you do. I know this church. The most generous people I've ever brown. Greatest, the greatest joy in my life is being your pastor. Outside of being married to my kids, being your pastor, right? <laughs> Uh, but you guys are awesome. And so we're going to pray together. And with your head bowed and eyes closed, that's all I want to leave you with. Does what concern God? Does it concern me? Some of you have never trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. The reality is you go, dude, my life doesn't have walls. Like, I, like metaphorically speaking, Jason, I feel like my life's being ravaged. I feel like things are a mess. And i got to be honest with you, I've never trusted the Jesus you were talking about that cared for people like he did. And I don't know the whole story. I don't understand the whole thing. But Jason, I know I was here Christmas Eve where I've been listening. And I need to trust Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. I need to trust Jesus for forgiveness right where you're at, right now. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Some of you right now, right where you're at, just say, Jesus, I'm choosing to follow you. For the first time, Jesus, I'm choosing to follow you and trust you. God, my life is a mess. I've never trusted you for the forgiveness of my sins. I'm choosing to follow you. For, forgive me, save me. And with head bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, bands praying. Jason, I prayed that, or I prayed that at Christmas Eve, and I'm not letting anybody know, or I prayed that the last few weeks, or I'm choosing, I'm just not letting anybody know that I'm a follower of Christ. I'm not going to call you down, but if you prayed that with me or have in the past few weeks chosen to follow Jesus, will you just lift your hand real high so I can pray for you, pray blessings over you? Awesome. Awesome. Blessings over the hands that are raised around this room from the front to the back. In a few moments, there'll be people, our prayer teams, I'll be standing down front as we close. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to talk with you. And if you made that decision today, our staff will be in the living room. Here's what I want us to do. Does what concern God concern us? And what we are doing by praying and fasting is we are putting to action, not just words, speaking the name of Jesus. That's what praying and fasting is. We are putting to words, speaking the name of Jesus. I think the next few weeks, we can tangibly experience God in a way we never have, not only individually, but as a church. Speak the name of Jesus. Sing this with us, Chloe. Sing it for us. Sing it with us, church, as we close. Show Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. And shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the street. So that's the name that we speak, the name that's above every name. As we begin a new year and all the things that face us, the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, that his name, every knee will bow, tongue confess. We're just going to go ahead and begin to claim that name now, not wait till then. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. And just as Joel prompted you a few moments ago, we close our service. Let's all say the name of Jesus together. One, two, three, Jesus. So we love you guys. It's going to be a fun few weeks. Grab a guide as you leave. We would love for you to be a part. Wednesday nights, January, starting this Wednesday, January 12th, 19th, 26th, one hour. 
Choose one to be here. Worship with us. Our team will be here. Pray with us. It'll be a powerful time. Love you guys. Be blessed. If I hadn't met you, I'll be down here. Our prayer teams are here as well. I would love to say hello. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday.